a pleasant day to all the listeners over there i am amulya pc from third b com q a and here i am going to take a small seminar on the topic income tax and these are the few contents which i which i am going to cover today the first one is meaning tax meaning classification of tax and their important definition residential status problems and solutions on residential status first we'll see what is meant by tax tax is nothing but a compulsory financial charge or some other type of uh, uh, levy imposed on a tax payer by a governmental organization in order to fund the government it's nothing but the payment of tax is uh, uh, important and it's a beneficial on multiple levels including the development of nation betterment of infrastructure the upliftment of the society and even for welfare activities for the nation it's mainly a fund for the government for a spending on various public expenditures the living of uh, taxes aims to raise revenues to fund governing or to alter prices in order to affect the demand as demand and supply plays a major role in the society the taxes uh, aims to raise the revenue towards those taxes are levied by government on the citizens to generate income for understanding projects as i already said for the betterment of the infrastructure to boost the economy of the country and to raise the standard living of its citizens there are so many people it's uh, as tax is not uh, imposed only for the high standards or uh, others who are in a rich level it for all for it's also for a common people for a small kid it's not uh, categorized for the people higher or medium or the low class standards it's common for all so it's mainly used to boost the economy of the country for the people who are in a low cadre who don't have food who don't have the facility of sanitary so for those people uh, it can boost them it can come up to a stage where they can stand in a position to to have a meal a day so so many people who don't eat, right so it can boost the economy the main thing the authority who have given me the authority of the government to levy tax in india is mainly derived from the constitution of india it is already framed in the constitution of india so a person who fails to pay the taxes can uh, punishable is punishable by law if we avoid the tax or uh, if we try to hide the income which we get we will be punished will be punished according to the law the next we will see how the structure of uh, tax has evolved in india tax structure in india is a three tier federal structure first one is central government state government and local municipal body make up the structure of tax according to the article 256 of the constitution states that no tax shall be levied or collected except by the authority of law if the tax is collected by each and everyone in the society so uh, they won't be knowing the people the common people won't be knowing to whom the tax is, is to be given or uh, some people may make lump sum of money out of that and can use for the illegal activities so it should be levied or collected only by the authority of law okay the next thing is we think the tax is a modern term it has been evolved after the modern uh, how to say modern period it's not like that it uh, the phrases is uh, in the phrases of, of tax in india is from its origin mean the prehistoric texts such as adhyasastra and manusmriti 
think that in that ancient period itself uh, there was the type of tax in india uh, like uh, the uh, as proposed by this manuscript the tax is paid by farmers and artisans in that era would be in the form of agricultural produce silver or gold these are the types of things which were paid by the farmers and arti artisans in those days okay uh, based on these texts the foundation of the modern tax system in india was conceptualized by the sir james wilson sir james wilson during the british rule in india in the year 1860 after the foundation of the modern tax sir james wilson have introduced during the british rule in the year 1816 he introduced the modern tax system in india i hope you understood about the indian tax subject something but there are three tax federal structures central government state government and local municipal bodies this make up the structure and according to the 256 of the constitution states that no tax shall be levied or collected except by the authority of law it should yeah, the government has the authority or the government has the total power to levy or collect the tax and uh, it's mainly been um, the indian traces of tax has been in the ancient period from prehistoric period like at the sastra and manuspriti the farmers and artisans pay the taxes in the form of agricultural produce silver or gold then the sir uh, james wilson in the 1860 he introduced the modern tax system in india this uh, the small summary or the gist of the indian tax structure the next we will see the types the tax system in india allows for two types it's nothing but direct indirect we'll see briefly in further slide uh then and before years in past years we have implemented gst the ta- the tax system in india for long was a complex one considering the length and breadth of india post gst implementation which is one of the biggest tax reform in india the process due to gst has become very smooth the society has uh, even developed and it's going in a better way as compared to the before implementation of gst it serves as an inclusive of indirect tax which has helped in eradicating and cascading effect of tax uh, tax as a whole it is simpler in nature and led to upgraded the productivity of logistics as it is simpler in nature it has uh, also it has also helped the help to upgrade the productivity of logistics as we all know gst is uh, introduced by our uh, by our former uh, by our honorable prime minister dr narendra modi so it has become a easy way and it has become a the, the process has become very smooth very smoother the next we will see the types direct tax and indirect tax is nothing but the whole call tax it consists of both so it becomes a common term tax direct tax in relation to its name direct it's nothing but uh, face to face or um, anything which is directly made a direct tax is levied directly on individuals and corporate entities this tax can't be transferred or borne by anybody else if for example if we take a a friend when we speak to a friend and another person can't uh, come inside and speak my words according to his wish so it should be in a direct way so it can't be borne by anybody else should be levied or collected directly from the individuals for examples of direct tax include income tax wealth tax gift tax and capital gains tax 
Income tax is the most popular tax within this section. Income tax plays a major role. It is levied on individuals on the income earned with the different tax slabs for income level. Before two weeks, there was a change in tax slab. Tax slab. So we should be. Um, uh, we should develop or uh, we should concatenate the upcoming updates of the tax slab. As uh, we are a commerce students, we should be updated to the technology of what is income tax, what are the slabs, what are the updates. Okay, it is the most popular tax, income tax, which is levied on the individuals on their incomes, how much they get, how, and it will be certain percentage. If we, uh, if our salary is within it, we shouldn't pay tax. So. Everything will be uh, based on the income earned. It will be on the income earned with the different tax class. Okay, this is nothing but direct tax. It is levied on directly, directly to the individual. Next, we will see the indirect tax. Indirect tax. Uh, when we See its name, it's nothing but indirectly. Mean by us, but in an indirect way. Indirect taxes are taxes which are indirectly levied on the public free people through goods and services. The sellers of the goods and services collect the tax, which is then collected by the government body. See how indirectly the government collects the tax from the people, from we the, the common people. Indirect taxes are taxes which are indirectly levied, indirectly levied on public through the goods and services which we buy or the, the services which we offer. Through those things, the public are uh, levied the indirect taxes and the sellers of the goods and services collect the tax which is then after the sellers get, then it is collected by the government bodies. It, these are there are few types of uh, four types of indirect taxes. First one is value added tax. It's nothing but a sales tax levied on goods sold within the state. If the goods are sold within the state or in the state, the rate is fixed by the government and it is collected by the government. So it's nothing but a tax levied on goods sold in the state. Okay. The next one is Octroy tax. Octroy tax, um, uh, we will be familiar with Octroy goods or Octroy tax. Uh, these are nothing but levied on goods which move from one state to another. The rate between, for example, if we take uh, the goods go from uh, Chennai to sorry Tamil Nadu to Karnataka, the rates will be uh, fixed and it's dependable on the state government. It depends on the state government. This is nothing but after tax, which are levied on goods which move from one state to another. The next is service tax. Government levies the tax on service providers, the people who are the uh, service providers, on the people who mean now for the service to the public on those things the government uh, levies the tax that is called service tax next is customs duty it is a tax levied on anything which is imported into india which is imported into india from foreign nations for example if we get a good or um, for example if we take the vaccines of covid 19 from russia or from America to India, it's a, I mean, we can't take medical things, we can take such as machineries. For example, a machinery for a juice extraction. If you want to buy, there will be some of the uh, other taxes which are levied on those things. So, uh, a tax levied on anything which is imported into India from a foreign nation. Indirect and direct tax is nothing but direct tax is uh, levied directly on individuals or corporate entities, whereas 
indirect tax or taxes which are indirectly levied on the public, which is at last at the end it is collected by the government in any case. We can't even I think I, there will be a middleman who collects the taxes directly it goes to the public. There is uh, there is a proper procedure, the proper method in all these tax systems. The next is the important definitions in income tax. Agricultural income. The first is agricultural income. It's nothing but any rent or revenue derived from land which is situated in India and is used for agricultural purpose. Any income derived from such land by agriculture, the performance by a cultivator or receiver of rent in kind of any process ordinarily employed by a cultivator or receiver of rent in kind to render. It's nothing but the rent or revenue derived from land which is situated and mainly it should be situated in India and is used for agricultural purpose. Any rent or revenue derived from land mainly it should be derived from land and it should not be a land which is situated in Sri Lanka or uh, uh, Pakistan or China. It should mainly be situated in India for the purposes like agriculture, the, purpose, the performance of cultivator, like uh, he can flow, he can uh, sell the uh, products which he gets. Anything which uh, the revenue is received or derived from land is it all comes under the agricultural income in tax. The next is accessing. Accessing in a simple word is nothing but a person who pays tax is nothing but accessing. Means a person by whom any tax or any other sum of money is payable. They produce, raised or received by him fit to be taken to market. Directly. It should be taken to market. It's nothing but we, the common people, are called as SSC. There are three, two types of SSC. We'll uh, see in the next slide. The first one is ordinary SSC. Any person against whom some proceedings are going on, it is immaterial whether any tax or other amount is payable by him or not. Any person who has sustained loss or still return of loss. It's nothing but the way the common people, we the ordinary people who should, a person against whom some proceedings are going on, who should pay the tax uh, directly, ordinary as the, who has sustained loss or still the return of loss, payable, it should be the amount which is payable by us. Immaterial, it can be a tax or other amount, it should be payable by a person with the ordinary assets, okay? Direct, I mean directly we should pay, that is known as ordinary assets. The next is representative assets or deemed assets. A person may not be liable only for his own income or loss, but also on the income or loss of other person. Whereas in ordinary assets, we saw that the uh, it's a tax uh, which should on the other amount payable by him or not is an ordinary SSC. Here, uh, we, it can't uh, be a single person. It may be, it may also be a, a another person. We will see an example so that you could understand. Agent of a non-resident, guardian of minor, a lunatic, etc. In such cases, he won't earn any uh, money. For example, we'll take guardian of minor he can't gain anything right so the person should be responsible for the assessment of income of such person is called representative assessee such person is deemed to an deemed to be an assessee so for example if we take a parent child relationship a child is a minor okay he is under 70 or 16 to 80 I mean, 16, you can take a, his age is 16. He's a minor, so he don't have a, enough capacity to earn. So in that case, 
his parents will be responsible to pay the income pay the income so that person is called representative assessee such person is deemed to be an assessee i hope you understand what is ordinary assessee and representative assessee the next we will go to the other thing the first one person the person includes an individual a hindu divided family a company a firm an association of persons or a body of individuals whether incorporated or not incorporated a local authority in person there are so many divisions and they should pay taxes on their own in the case of individual he should pay on his uh, directly in case of hindu undivided family a karta the head should pay the tax in behalf of all the members and these are the few divisions and the person who are included this is uh, these are the five important definitions of taxes so next we will go to the residential state residential state there are three types ordinary resident ordinary a resident resident not ordinarily resident non resident the taxability of an individual in india depends upon his residential status in india for any particular financial year the term residential status has been coined under the income tax law of india the taxability of any individual in india depends upon his residential status we will see what are they and how they are calculated in the further slide the taxability of an in individual in india depends on his residential status for any particular financial year the term residential status has been coined under the income tax laws of india for the purpose of income tax in india the income tax laws in india classified into three three types a resident ordinary resident resident not ordinarily resident third one is non resident first we will see who is the person ordinary resident ordinary resident a person tax payer who qualify as a resident of india who satisfies one of the following two conditions according to the section 61a a person who stays in india for a year or more than or at least 192 days in current previous year here current previous year is nothing but 2019-20 the period is 1st april 2019 to 31st march 2020 this is the current previous year for the current financial year 2020-21 i hope you understand what is financial year and what is current previous year so first condition of according to the section 61a a person should stay in india for a year or for more than or at least 182 days in current previous year which i have mentioned here is cty the second condition if he did meet the second condition is according to the section 61c 61b has been cancelled and mostly 61c the uh, most mean not mostly uh, it has been cancelled and uh, 61c has been implemented according to the section 61c a person who stays in india for at least 60 days in current previous year and 365 days in four preceding previous year according to the section 6 of 61 of c a person who stays in india for at least 60 days in current previous year that is 2019 to 2020 in current previous year he should stay at least 60 days and 
365 days in four preceding previous years. Here, the four preceding three, at least he should uh, be in uh, India. 365 days in four preceding previous year. These are the two conditions of ordinary residence. If uh, he attempts, I mean, if he complete, if the condition is approved, he is a uh, resident of India or he is not resident of India. Okay, next we will see not ordinary resident. When we come to the problem, problems, we will be able to understand in a perfect and in a clear manner what is ordinary resident, not ordinary resident and non-resident. So next we will see what is not ordinarily resident. Not ordinarily, ordinarily resident. If an, it's nothing but if an individual qualifies as a resident. If I am a resident, the next step is to determine if he or she is a resident, ordinarily, ordinarily resident, or a resident not ordinarily resident. He will be a R O R if he meets both of the following conditions. The first one is according to the section 6 of 6A, a person who stayed in India only one year out of 10 preceding previous years. According to the section 6 of 6A, a person who stayed in India only one year, only one year out of 10 preceding previous years. If he live one year out of 10 years, he is a not ordinary, ordinarily resident. If he meets this, this condition, he is a resident. If he didn't meet, the second condition is, according to the section 6 of 6, person who stayed in India for 729 days or less in 7 preceding previous years is, an, is a not ordinarily resident. According to the section 6 of 6, person who stayed in India for for 729 days or less than it in seven preceding previous years is the not ordinarily resident. It will be quite confusing when we see the conditions. When we come to the problems, it will be very easy to understand. It, uh, it will be in a manual, manual manner where we could solve the answers in a easy way so after now we know what is it and then we will when we go to the problem it will be an easy way to understand in a brief way to I mean uh, explain to me also the first condition is nothing but who stayed in india only one year out of 10 preceding year one by 10 we can for a simple thing to what is there to recognize? We can uh, take like a 1 by 10. So only 1 year out of 10 preceding years is first condition. The second is nothing but 729 days in 7 preceding previous year. It should not be less than 729. At least it should be 729 days and uh, in 7 preceding previous year. This is the second condition. The next we will see about the non resident An individual satisfying neither of the conditions stated in ordinary resident and not ordinarily resident would be a non-resident for the year. He is the non-resident. Mean who the person means. He didn't satisfy neither of the conditions. Ordinary resident and not ordinary resident would be a non-resident for the country. Sorry, non resident for the year and for the country also. So, next we will move on to the problems and solutions for the conditions which we have uh, seen before. The first problem Mr. Hemo, an Indian citizen, leaves the India for the first time. The question will be in an easy form, and the people should read it twice or thrice to understand it in a easy manner. India for the first time on 1st September 2019 
and comes back to India on 10th February 2020-20. Calculate his residential status. Okay, I will give you a few seconds to you read the question and come back. I think you have read and the clue word is the first time. First time, first September 2019 and, and he comes back on 10th of February 2020. As we all know, the current previous year is April 2019 to 31st March 2020. Okay. Solution. Since they form it and this should be in a perfect manner before starting a problem. Computation of residential status. Sorry, status, I think spelling is wrong. Do change it. I will do change it afterwards. Computation of residential status of Mr. Hemu for the previous year. Previous year. This is the format and it should be in a perfect way. For the previous year, uh, 2019-20 also, you can write. According to the first condition, according to the section 6, what a, a person who stays in India for a year or for at least 182 days in current previous year, we should know whether he satisfies this uh, condition or not. So we'll go back to the, I mean, get back to the next slide and we will see whether he completes or he satisfies or not. In the April, he was in India. He left India for the first time on 15th July. So, our financial year uh, <coughs> starts from April, right? So, April 30, he was here. May 30, the whole month he was here. June also he was here. But July, he was for 15 days. We should also calculate for the day which we which he leaves or day which we comes back on july 15th he leaves so 15 days he was here august he was not there september no october no november no december no january no february 2012 he comes back to india on 10 february 2020 so we should take here that in February there are 29 days because it's a leap year. So one day is added. Nine days as I told you should also take the day which he comes back also. So 29 minus 9 is 20. Then March he will be there for whole month. When we add all this, sum up all this, we will get 157 days. According to what is our condition? According to the section 61A, it's nothing but a person who stays in India for a year or for at least for more than or at least 182 days in current previous year. He was there for 157 days. So, Mr. Sonu has a story, I think I have changed the name. Him who has uh, satisfied, sorry, the slide has been skipped to adjust. I will uh, make a change right now. Sorry, uh, that was uh, for the next sum. I will go here. On the 10th February, he uh, comes back and for the first time, he moves uh, on on September 2019. This is the first sum and the solution be like April 30, he was here. May 31, he was here. June 30, also he was here. June 31, the whole month. August, the whole month. Whereas in September, he leaves on 1st September. So, as I said, you should also calculate for the day he comes in or the day he goes out. 
for one day he was in september but october no november no december no zero days january zero but in february he comes back to india on 10th february but we have taken as 20 why because 29 days uh, as 2020 20 is a leap year um 29 minus 9 is something but 20 plus in march um he was for the whole month here you shouldn't be confused because of the leap year i have taken 29 not for uh, for 2017 2018 you can take as 28 as you all know about leap year it should be 29 right so when we sum up of all these things we will get 182 days according to our condition of 618 a person should stay in india for more than or at least 182 days in current previous year is a ordinary resident now mr hemu has met the condition and now he is a resident of india he is a ordinary resident i hope you understood the first question it is a simple one and there is no confusion here i hope so there is no confusion in the first sum now we will go to the second sum Okay. The second question is Miss Tonu, an Indian citizen, leaves the India for the first time on 15th July 2019. Here, as I said, you should be very careful with these things first time and comes back to India on 10th February 2020. Calculate his residential status. As I said, there should be a format called computation of residential status of Mr. Hemu for the previous year. According to the section 61A, a person who stays in India for a year or for at least 182 days in current previous year. This is the first condition we should see whether Ms. Sonu has a, a completed or acquired the condition or not we'll go to the solution now and we all know the first time she went on 15th july 2019 april 30 april may june she was for the whole month whereas july 15th she left she left india so as I said, we should take the arrival day as well as the day she goes back. So, 15 days totally in August, September, October, November, December, January. She was not here and it should be summed up for zero. Whereas February, she comes back to India on 10th February 2020. As I have already said, as 2020-20 is a leap year, we should take a 29 and 29 minus 9 is nothing but 20. So, March 31. As we all sum up, we'll get 157 days. But what is the condition according to the 6 one He should stay for at least 182 days. So, he has not satisfied, sorry, she has not satisfied the condition so you should uh, um, you should go to the next condition according to the section 61c a person who stays in india for at least 60 days in current previous year i hope you people understand this uh, condition right now at least 60 days whereas Ms. Sonu has um uh for, was in India for 157 days in current previous year and 365 days in four preceding previous year. So here we could know that Ms. Sonu, she was, she has satisfied this, uh, the condition according to the section 61C 
and she is an ordinary resident i hope you understood the second sum it's a simple sum and there is no confusion then in only she have uh, she was in current previous year 157 days in first condition 61a she should be for at least uh, 182 days so she has not satisfied whereas in second condition at least for 60 days if she is in uh, current previous year and 365 days how to find that she was in india for 365 days as we have mentioned for the first time first time before those years she was in india so for four preceding years she was in india from this we can conclude that she is a she is an ordinary resident okay the last problem miss monu an indian citizen leaves the india for the first time on 18th september 2017 see the years plays a major role here and comes back to india on 12th august 2018 she comes back and then he went to london on 23rd june 2019 and comes back to India on 27th March 2020. Calculate his residential status. So there are uh, two timings right here. First thing, uh, first time she went on 18th September and comes back to India on 12th August. Then she goes to London on 23rd June and comes back to India on 27th March 2020. So slowly we will go and complete the problem. The first thing has a already I told the format. Then the first condition. According to the section 61A, a person who stays in India for a year or more than or at least 182 days in current previous year. As we already know, the current previous year is 2019 to 2020. Okay, first we will calculate for current previous year and we can see whether she have uh, attained the first condition. We already know that uh, she left India on 18th September 2017 and she came back. We will see for uh, 2019 20, 23rd June. 27th March. Okay, 23rd. Uh, one minute. 23rd, uh, what is that? 23rd June. 27th. We should keep this on our mind when we calculate for current previous year. So we will see now April she was here, May, June. June she left on which day? It was on 18th September. So 17 minus 30. 30, yeah, 17 minus 30 is nothing but 23. Okay, July she was not there. August, September, October, November, December, Jan, Feb. If we end the uh, summer fall, we should give as zero because she was not here. March, she came to India on 27th of March. As I already said, we should. Also take the departure and the arrival date. So 31 minus 26 is 5. And she was in India for only 89 days in current previous year. So here she has not satisfied the condition of section 61A. So we'll move to the another term, the second condition. It's nothing but according to the section 61C. A person who stays in India for at least 60 days in current previous year where she has not attained the condition and 365 days in four preceding previous years. 365 days we should check because uh, she went to other country on 2017 which was a preceding previous year. So we will check through this condition. So first we will know what are the four preceding previous years. The first is 2018, 19, 17, 18, 16, 17, 
and 1560. These are the four previous preceding years. I will move one by one. First, we have calculated the current previous year. The next first previous year, previous preceding year is 1890. As we already know, she there she. One minute, I will go to the question and come back. 18th September on 2017, he go. She goes and 12th August. As we are updating for 1890, we should be careful on these 12th August. April, she was not there. May, June, July, she was not there for the whole month. There is August. She was. Uh, she came. Uh, to india on 25 so as i said we should conclude it for sorry she came to india on 12th august so we should uh, conclude it for the thing so 31 minus 11 is nothing but 20 days september 30 october 31 november 30 december 31 january 31 february and march now she was here for the whole month, except uh, this calculation. I, I hope you are clear about this. It's nothing but it's a very simple thing. She went to other country 17. She came back here on 12th August. So 11 minus 31 is 20. April, May, June, she was not there, so it's zero. From here, as I said, the calculation after August from September to March, she was in India for the all month. So, when we sum up all these, we will get 232 days in 1819. Okay, next we will see the second preceding previous year, 1718. In April, she was here, May, she was here, June, July, August, September. When it comes to September, she leaves to other country on September 18, 2017. And she didn't come back in the financial year, uh, mean uh, in the year seven, previous year 1718. So from October to March, it's zero. When we sum up all these, we get 171 days. Okay. I think uh, the first two years are clear. Whereas, she left for uh, in question they have given for the first time. So we can uh, easily understand that for the third and fourth preceding previous, such as 16 and 17 and 15 and 16, she was in India for the whole year. That is 365 days here and 366 days here. When we sum up all these four years, we are getting a total of 1,100. 34 days. But according to our uh, condition, what is the thing? 365 days in four preceding previous years. So, from this thing, we can see that she has uh, attained 1,134 days. She was here in India for uh, 1,134 days. From this, we could uh, uh, Say that she has satisfied the section 61 and she is an ordinary resident. I hope you all understood this sum. It's nothing but a simple term which is a little bit confusing for the first time. It will be confusing, but when we go further, it will be a very easy and a very easy sum for us. First time she went on 18 September and comes back to India on 12th August. Then she goes again to London on 23rd June and then comes back again on 27th March. It's nothing but we should uh, be very careful when calculating for the four preceding previous years. I've explained it when uh, in this, this slide when I taught you people. So that's it. And thank you. Thank you for viewing my slide and thank you. Thanks again.